Tech. Welcome to the Lightning Talk session. So once again, I'm Katie Courier, a postdoc at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And before we dive into our nine Lightning Talks, I'd, mention, I'd like to mention that all of our speakers today volunteered to participate before they knew exactly what they were getting into. So after they expressed interest, we, the organizers, invited them to give a talk with two strict parameters. One, the talk should be three minutes long with no more than three slides. So all of today's speakers accepted this challenge, and in the next 35 minutes or so, we plan on nine lightning talks. So after everyone has given their talk, we'll have a few minutes left over for questions. So with, with that, let's bring on our first speakers, a team of Phil Barty and Will, William McCannis. Phil Barty is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at Harriet Watt University and William McCannis is a senior lecturer in the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh. And the title of their talk is Open AI's Large Language Models and Spatial Data Science. So uh, I see your screen. And once, once we see your video, hello, they're both joining from the same. So we see your video and we hear you just fine. So cool. the time is yours. Ready, go. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to show what we thought was interesting to do with ChatGPT and spatial databases. So you can see, hopefully, in the video here, um, we gave it a table definition. We didn't actually give it any data, but we told it we're going to have a bus data table. And at this point, it starts telling us all the field types, including recognizing geometry is going to be where the bus locations are stored. So then we ask it a natural language question to tell me how many bus services there are. Uh, remember, it hasn't got any data, just a definition. It correctly uses the count function and also the distinct service from that particular table. So we're quite impressed with this. And we thought, well, what happens if we give it another table? So I say, I've also got a table called SIMD 2020, which has got some polygons in it. It then goes through and describes uh, the various field types, recognizing again the geometry. And somehow, amazingly, it recognized SIMD might be the Scottish index of multiple deprivation, which is actually what it was from. So it's from the census data. Um, and then we thought, let's ask it a question that combines data from both those tables. So we said, which polygon has the slowest average bus speed with a condition of a minimum of 20 samples in that data zone? And amazingly, it writes the query with the spatial intersection here between those two different um, tables. And it's added the having clause with uh, having greater than 20. So impressed by what it had done there, we thought, what about if we ask it to pretend to be a Linux server and actually be a spatial database? So it quite happily obliged and pretended to be a Linux server. Uh, we just tested that with a basic list function, which it performed. And then we thought, can we log into Postgres, which of course we haven't installed, it's a large language model, but it acted like it had Postgres 13.3 installed. So we created a table in our pretend database with again, geometry in it and a nice bus log. We then inserted a record into there with uh, putting a point at one one coordinate. Um, and we just checked it was there. And amazingly at this point, it actually showed us the binary value for that point at one one, uh, which I did check and was correct. Then we asked it a spatial distance function from that point at 1, 1 to 4, 5, which should be a 3, 4, 5 triangle with a value 5, but it gave us a value of 5.6. So in other words, it's hallucinated the answer. It's not really doing the job. We then said, OK, create 10 uh, random locations for us inside a boundary of, sort of Edinburgh uh, using EPSG 4326. It created the code it needed to do that and interestingly ran it for us, even though we didn't ask it to. Um, we checked that. And again, it's created all those binary values. But when we plot them, they're completely in the wrong place. So we thought, well, does it know where Edinburgh is? Well, we asked it to create a polygon around Edinburgh. It created the query for that. And um, when we plotted that in QGIS, it's kind of close, but it's a bit far south of where it really is. Finally, uh, something a bit of difference. We're using GPT to classify text. This is an example from a collection of tweets related to carbon capture and storage, or CCS. The challenge is that CCS is an acronym that stands for other things, such as Cardiff City Stadium. Uh, which hosts football games, but GPT had no trouble being able to differentiate these different tweets. So in conclusion, we believe GPT will help geographers in rapid writing of code and spatial queries, including the provision of explanations of the syntax. And it's also proved useful in helping analyze and classify unstructured text, such as is typically collected in surveys and questionnaires. Hey, hey thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Excellent. That was three minutes on the nose. So thank you very much to our, uh, our first speakers for starting us out on such a good foot. Now let's bring up um, our second speaker, will be Sundas Liakat, 
GIS analyst and postgraduate scholar in GIS and remote sensing at I3A Solutions and the National University of Science. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Uh, so hello everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I'll give you uh, try to give you an interesting presentation after all that uh, excellent line of speakers. And I'm going to use an approach for discussion a little bit differently. Uh, that how GI, uh, geo AI to monitor and analyze uh, changes in the land cover and land use uh, and prediction of the impacts of climate change. Uh, so, uh, a latest platform of cloud computing, Google Earth Engine, as we all know that climate change is a major global issue uh, that possesses significant challenges to the environment, economy, and society. So, one of the key impacts of the climate change in land use land cover, which can possess a significant impact on the natural resources, biodiversity, and food security. So, Geo AI is a powerful technology that combines satellite imageries, machine learning, deep learning, and analytics to provide the uh, platform like Geo, uh, Google Earth Engine uh, into the changes of the land use land cover by analyzing the large data sets of the time series like for the climate change as we have to analyze uh, 30 years period. So, uh, this platform uh, gives you a large data sets by analyzing the time series of climate change of 30 years long time period that can help in monitoring and even predicting the impact of the climate change um, and its mitigation strategies, of course. And um, GOAI can quickly identify the changes in the land use, land cover pattern, urbanization, and uh, the de uh, deforestation and other all the land use and land cover pattern in a uh, in a simple uh, country or in a local area. So prediction of land use land cover can identify the problems that are currently happening and in future also uh, to uh, give the mitigation strategies for that specific area. So geo AI is helps to monitor analyze and predict the climate change scenarios that help out to inform the policy decisions such as land use planning and promotion of the sustainability land management system. So this all from my side uh, is just an introductory, uh, like how we use the Google Earth Engine for the multi petabyte catalog of the satellite imagery and geodata, uh, data sets of plant use skill analysis capabilities. So to, to detect and change the map trends and quantify the differences on the Earth surface and Earth Engine is now available for researchers uh, free of cost and for commercial use and academia. So uh, that's all. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Sundas. You came in before the gong. So very nicely done. Thank you um, so much. Let me see the applause coming in. So uh, now we'd like to bring up our next speaker. Our next speaker will be Jin Meng Rao, research assistant at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And the title of Jin Meng's talk is Privacy and Security Issues in Large Language Model Powered Geospatial Applications. So Jin Meng. The stage is yours. Okay. Thank you, Kizzy. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Jim Monroe from UW Medicine. I work with Professor Sung Gao on privacy preserving geo AI. And my talk is it's about uh, privacy and the security issues. So we know today LLMs involve really fast, but many countries and the companies are trying to ban them due to privacy concerns. So you may want to ask uh, why do people think LLM applications are so dangerous? So here I made a simplified paradigm uh, of LLM ap applications. Overall, we collect the data and we train LLM and allow user interaction. Uh, we can also connect the LLM to external resources to do more things. And uh, recent geospatial applications like chat uh, GOPT and MapGPT, they all follow this idea. So what could go wrong in such a workflow? Well, quite a lot. 
Uh, for example, both the data involved and the user input may contain sensitive information arising privacy issues. And also attackers can induce uh, LLMs to output sensitive information uh, with a technique called prompt attacks. Uh, next slide, please. So here are some uh, examples of uh, prompt attacks, uh, which are quite interesting. Uh, assume attackers want to get my uh, home location, right? And if they, if they just say, hey, where Jimin lives, this is too, just too obvious and usually won't work. Uh, an improved version is the do anything now prompt, where attackers induce the LMs to ignore safety policy and answer anything. A similar one is the developer mode, uh, where the attackers say, hey, I'm a test engineer at your company and we are now in a developer mode. And the LM be like, okay, boss, whatever you say. Uh, another example is uh, prompt leaking, where attackers induce the LM to output the predefined prompt. So if you put your sensitive information like a database credential there, it's quite dangerous. And today I just want to introduce this prompt, but there are actually more. So for large platforms like OpenAI and Google, they might just uh, uh, only very complex uh, prompt attacks would work since they have uh, mature uh, safety me measures. And uh, for smaller platforms, even uh, simple prompt attacks could be very dangerous. Uh, next slide, please. So what can we do about it? Here, I would like to advocate for a privacy preserving and secure LM geospatial applications where we can follow certain uh, privacy and safety regulations. For example, uh, we can regulate the use of data and introduce differential privacy and fidelity learning to further protect the privacy. Uh, we can also add a content identifier to identify uh, whether user discloses uh, uh, sensitive information or whether the input contains prompt attacks. So uh, finally, I hope this talk could uh, contribute insights towards safeguarding privacy and security in large language model powered geospatial applications. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Jin Meng, coming in also uh, under the gong. So um, lots of applause there. So our next uh, speaker will be Hamda Banu, a bachelor student in geography at Eastern University, Sri Lanka. She's a member of the Youth Mappers chapter and president of the Disaster Management Unit at her university. And the title of Hamda's talk is Sri Lankans and Chat GPT for Geographic Tasks. Hamda, the stage is yours. Uh, this is my bio. I'm going to present about Sri Lankans and ChatGPT for geographic tasks. The adoption of ChatGPT in Sri Lanka may have started more recently as the awareness and adoption of AI technologies have been increasing globally. ChatGPT may not have reached all corners of Sri Lanka yet. Next slide. However, geography students using ChatGPT in their studies like research. This can help students gain a better understanding of complex concepts and develop more informed research questions. Data analysis. This is identify patterns and trends in geographic data which can inform research and decision making. Language translation. We can communicate with and understand research from diverse community, writing support. We can improve our writing skills and produce higher quality research. There are lots of tasks we are doing with youth members and disaster management unit using ChatGPT. In disaster management unit, ChatGPT help us in decision making and coordinate response effort more efficiently and also it helps inform disaster response and mitigation strategies. ChatGPT facilitate communications and ensure that critical information is conveyed accuracy and efficiently to mitigate mitigate disaster impact. It prepared for disaster and rescue their impact of on affected communities. In OSM, it helps us with knowledge, data enrichment, natural language process, and community engagement. Next slide. <clears throat> ChatGPT will change our university and higher school education in geography STEM in future some ways like automated data analysis, 
natural language interfaces, interactive maps, smart assistants, real-time translation, automated report generation, and natural language summarization also. Thank you. All right. Very well done. Thank you so much, Hamda, for this presentation delivered under the gong. Uh, so for our next speakers, speaker, uh, let's bring on Chen Ling Meng, PhD student in computer science at Stanford University. And the title of Chen Ling's talk, Generative Modeling in Remote Sensing. So Chen Ling, I see Hello. your video. And we hear you, okay. so the stage okay, is cool. yours. Cool. So hello, everyone. I'm Chen Lin from Stanford University. And today I'm super happy to be uh, talking about the real world applications of the noise and diffusion probabilistic models. Next slide, please. So you might have heard about diffusion models. So uh, diffusion models have actually shown state of the art performance on uh, high resolution image generation. So for instance, all of the images you've seen on this slide, they are actually fake machine generated images. The first image is about a, a panda scientist mixing sparkling chemicals. It's actually one image generated by DALI2. And the second image is actually gen uh, like generated by Imogen, which is the model released by Google Brain's team. And then the third image is uh, about an astronaut. It's also synthetic image. Uh, generated by stable diffusion from stability AI. And as we can see, this generative AI approach has revolutionized uh, the field and they are able to generate high quality, high resolution, high fidelity images. Next slide, please. Uh, okay. So uh, we know that like in lots of the remote sensing applications, we're constantly facing this issue that we have lots of unlabeled images, but we want to, but uh, labeled data is actually very, very expensive to acquire. And also sometimes we might have very imbalanced data set where let's say we have lots of images about a forest, but we don't have images about an airplane. So basically uh, our question here is that, can we use diffusion models to generate data for remote sensing applications? So, um, so actually the answer is yes. So here I would like to show some examples here. So basically we can take an off the shelf stable diffusion model and then do some fine tuning on the stable diffusion model to ask it to generate images related to remote sensing applications. So for instance, um, so if you, uh, as you can see in the, in the lab panel, we actually took off the shelf stable diffusion model and then we fine tune it on functional map, functional map of the world data set. And then we asked the model to generate a very out of distribution prompt, which is a realistic photo of an astronaut riding a horse. And as we can see, um, the model is able to retain lots of the inductive bias from the pre-trained model, but at the same time, uh, be able to transfer to new domains. So I would like to conclude my talk with some examples on the playground. So as you can see on the right, the diffusion model is able to generate high quality image on different domains. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Tenlin. Um, very well done. Also below the, below the gong. So for our next speaker, uh, let's welcome to the stage Anna Brandushaskiu, a PhD student in the Department of Geography at McGill University. And the title of Anna's talk is Generative AI and the Scale of Public Sector Governance. So great, Anna. I see your video. Thank you for the stage. Thank you for the, the, the time is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, today I will briefly present on generative AI and the scale of public sector governance. So what do I mean by governance? Governance, public and private. Um, can, can consist of mechanisms orchestrated by actors in select groups who create and coordinate processes to deploy generative AI that influence government decisions. My focus here is on government and the private sector. Next slide, please. 
Researching governance around generative AI entails working with three important factors. First, the concentration of power and capacity at the hands of private sector actors, especially big tech companies. This includes both human and non-human resources and the transfer of decision-making power from government to the private sector. Second, the capacity to government can be found in the unknown decisions that get made by the black box and the steep learning curve in the skills required to build generative AI. Nevertheless, government is developing AI and not just deploying it. And that leads me to the third point, that AI is a powerful tool for government. Generative AI also can be transformative and could kick off the next technological revolution, for instance, with ChatGPT. Regulations can play a big role in governance. They can be crafted by people for the private sector developing AI, which is governance of AI. Regulations can also be created by AI with public sector adoption of AI, which is governance by AI. Next slide, please. More specifically, this means investigating political power and privatization in the governance around generative AI. So why focus on political power and privatization? Political power can make explicit how individuals or groups influence and uh, policy and government decisions, especially since differentials in political power tend to be absent in discourses on governance around generative AI. And privatization can clarify the role of private sector power to which important decisions about governments are ceded, for example, to large consulting firms or AI developers. The scale of public sector governance of generative AI means addressing differences between types of AI. GeoAI differs from public sector IT in technical scaling and jurisdictional issues in governance, which pose ethical, social, and political challenges. Generative GeoAI differs from GeoAI in the issues deriving from deeply embedded bias of foundation models that can exacerbate discrimination for race and gender. There are also privacy concerns regarding personal data and consent, misrepresentations like fake speech from elected officials, and the lack of disclosure and generative AI being used, which can lead to a massive loss of trust. Hence, the need and criticality to research and investigate public sector governance around generative AI. Thank you. Can't ask for a more perfect uh, ending than that. Thank you very much, Anna, for your presentation. Uh, our next presenter is Yu Hao Kang. Uh, recently received his PhD at the University of Wisconsin Madison and will be an assistant professor in GI science at the University of South Carolina starting this fall. So the title of Yu Hao's uh, presentation is The Ethics of AI Generated Maps, A Study of DALI 2 and Implications for Cartography. So Yu Hao, please go ahead, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Katie. Hello everyone, it's my great pleasure to be part of this event. I'm Yu Hao Kao, um, and a PhD at University of Wisconsin-Madison and will be an assistant professor at the University of South Carolina. Uh, today, I would like to share with you our work about AI-generated maps. Artificial generative models such as DALL-2, um, Stable Diffusion, and MidJourney um, provide opportunities to facilitate the map-making process as mentioned by previous speakers. So as a cartographer, um, I'm curious, can AGI um, generate maps? So we made an exploration using the following prompt with Stella 2. As you can see, here are some example maps in different regions. They are, all have different styles. And you can see they deliver some basic geography information and have the shapes of different regions, may have certain uh, spatial patterns, and the maps can be placed at different places. Uh, next slide, please. However, uh, cartographers have always been concerned about the ethical issues that may uh, arise from maps, such as the inaccuracies due to the data uncertainty and bias, uh, and it may controlled by powers. So similarly, DALL-2 generated maps may also raise some ethical concerns. Uh, I summarize four ethical concerns here. The first one refers to the inaccuracy uh, because it may generate some uncleared borderlines like in California. And the second map refers to um, Washington state in the United States. And as you can see, the, its shape distorted. And uh, it may, the dollar two can only generate fixed uh, size of output maps, which means some regions might be discarded. The second issue refers to the misleading information 
because it may generate some pseudo words and it may generate some fake regions that may not exist. Uh, it may also generate some unanticipated features, like the road lines are represented as twisted lines. And we ask uh, dollar two to generate a heat map, but actually it generates a lava style maps. And it may generate some geopolitical identity uh, maps with geopolitical identities, even if we just ask it to generate uh, a North Korea map. And it is hard to be re uh, reproduced because even if we input the same uh, prompts, the maps are still different. So uh, these are the four ethical concerns. And next slide, please. Therefore, we believe it is crucial to examine the potential ethical concerns raised by these AI-generated maps. To tackle this, we developed an ethical examination system that can identify whether a map is generated by AI or it is a human design map. So in conclusion, although AGI may have the potential uh, to facilitate the map making process, it is still essential to consider the potential ethical concerns that rise from this. Our paper has been published on archive, so please feel free to take a read. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Yu Hao, for that presentation. Yeah, and I think the previous speaker is also here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Oops, excuse me. Uh, yes, so uh, we are going to return to Piotr. So let's bring Piotr to the stage. I think I'll need some help with that, uh, Zilong. And yep, great. So Piotr, I see you on the stage. Hello everyone, uh, I'm sorry for causing trouble, uh, I must have clicked the, the wrong uh, link for the event. Uh, so I, I'm, I'd like to talk to you about the, uh, the case for um, uh, generating map layers using existing large uh, AI models. Uh, as we know, they are quite good in, uh, in many areas and uh, in remixing uh, photography or in, uh, or in generating conversations and everything else. But uh, they don't really do well in terms of reality grounded results. And there's been a couple of papers about that. Let's find out how they fare with maps. Those are the examples with, I asked it to generate uh, uh, an area plan in the style of 15 minute city. Um, and you see that it got some concepts that we can see from the, as a human with an intuition, you can see that it tries to do something here, but the, they aren't really good maps. Uh, uh, and we can see it at first sight. Next slide, please. Uh, so I asked GPT for perhaps to get generate a better prompt. That's a standard procedure, you know, with generating um, AI uh, generated imagery recently. The, you know, those image, those even those videos that you've seen uh, uh, go viral, they use this kind of approaches. And it's even worse because it turns out that the model actually uh, memorized the uh, elements that uh, come from um, I don't know, maybe documentation of software, uh, which includes, uh, you know, screenshots, it generates screenshots of, of map software, which is not really a good answer to this prompt. Uh, next question, no, next, no, next slide, please. Uh, uh, and so um, maybe a vector layer would have worked then. So, uh, you know, Geo, uh, GPT was really good at generating code. Maybe it could generate a GeoJSON. It actually won't do it. It used to generate uh, this kind of stuff, but it won't do it now. The, the, you get the warning that as an AI, it doesn't generate uh, uh, GeoJSON files. It changed at some point. And it did output a sample which wasn't even parsable, uh, which means that we're not really in a good situation with a working solution, but that's, that we can look at it as a, a lucky situation because there's a lot of progress to be made. Uh, so uh, what could we start doing with this? We could uh, start curating data sets with described map tiles to get both map style and urban planning uh, style information for style transfer from, for prompting, train multitask large models on, on map data only, um, and also uh, fine tuning for, for dif different stuff, uh, which is, uh, what, what, what seems to be a very important thing to do is to generate, uh, to, to come up with something that would be an equivalent of reinforcement learning for map imagery, uh, which is, the question is still open at the moment. Uh, but the, the, there's certainly a lot of things to do, and I wanted to encourage you to, 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 to take those things as challenges and try to, to come up with some solutions. Uh, 
I'm really open to cooperation, so get in contact with me if you want to work on something of, the, of this kind. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Piotr. I'm glad that you were able to, to join us today. Thank you. So uh, let's bring up our final speaker of the, our final lightning talk speaker of the session, Joshua Bailey, Senior Data Scientist at SWCA Environmental Consultants. And the title of Joshua's talk, Large Language Models for Environmental Data Science with Geospatial Data and Tools Enabled by Langchain. Joshua, I see you on stage. And it looks like Hello. your mic is activated. I hear you. Thank you. So if, if you'd like to come on video, please do. Otherwise, I'll No, we'll just get started. Um, All right. So I'd like to introduce everybody to a framework called Langchain. And this is a framework for applications powered by large language models. So it takes models like ChatGPT kind of out of the web browser and gives them access to data and tools with two key objectives. It makes them data aware so that instead of going on things that it found in its training data or just from, you know, whatever it can make up and hallucinate, it connects to data sources and makes uh, decisions based on that. And also it gives the models agencies agency so that they can interact with their environment. And language models are text in, text out, but if you call them in a recursive way where you take their, you take their output and maybe it's code, you run the code and then give the output of the code as the next input, then you can achieve a lot. So Langchain provides modular components and abstractions that allows you to use different models. So you can use open AI models, but also anything from Hugging Face or you can use Llama, anything really. Um, this is important. So uh, move to the next slide and I'll show you an example of this in action. So hopefully you can see this, but I have an agent that I pulled into a Jupyter notebook inside ArcGIS Pro. And in this case, I was giving it natural language instruction. So I was saying things like take this layer, create a buffer, intersect with this other layer. Um, and in some cases, as you can see there on the left, it had to do real time problem solving. So I told it to do zonal statistics, but I didn't tell it which field to use. So first it had to look up what fields were in the thing so that it could decide which field was appropriate to use. Um, in this case, it also had access to the Microsoft Planetary Computer API, which is a cloud data resource similar to Google Earth Engine, has petabytes of information on there. So for context here, I told it there was a fire in 2017 in this study area. Get imagery from before and after and compare the normalized difference vegetation index. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see this, but on the left, we have a seasonal cloud-free composite from spring 2016, and on the right is the same image, but from 2018. The fire took place in 2017, and uh, I'll give an overview of what that output actually says. It's an analysis of the vegetation health and productivity from 2016, 2018, and the change that took place. So I got that imagery from the planetary computer. It used ArcGIS to calculate the NDVI. It looked at the summary statistics. Um, it really emphasizes cautious interpretation, not jumping to inclusions or not jumping to conclusions. It stresses the importance of being cautiously interpreted by subject matter experts. But you can imagine a use case where maybe this uses various spectral indices or deep learning computer vision and summarizes the reports. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joshua. And perhaps an assistant. Uh, we assume that it's not you who's barking there. Um, so now I'd like to ask for help bringing all of our lightning talk speakers to the stage. And we have about uh, eight minutes or so for questions. So it'll take us just a moment to bring everyone on stage. And if you'd like to come off, uh, come on video, you're welcome to or not. But let's go on over to the questions. And I'd like to uh, bring on this first question for Jin Meng. Can you give more information on how to achieve privacy protections with large language models? Yes, uh, thank you, Jeremy. This is a really good question. Um, I think for privacy preservation in large language model, we have uh, 
uh, several concepts, uh, several aspects to consider. First one is on the uh, data side. We need to make sure that the data involved for training data, uh, for training the module, do not con con uh, you know, uh, contain any sensitive information. And uh, on the user side, we will need to make sure we do not send any sensitive information to the LLM. And usually we can set something to detect whether user is sharing sensitive information there. So I think uh, from data side and uh, server side, we need to do some uh, regulation and protection, which can make sure that uh, uh, we can preserve user privacy. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you for the question and thank you for the answer, Jinming. So I'm just going to move on to the next question that's uh, popped up in the chat or in the Q&A panel. As a reminder, you're welcome to type in more. Um, this is a question for Hamda. How are you ensuring that the students will not suffer hallucina from hallucinations in the answers from ChatGPT? For example, the IPCC ChatGPT query tool is giving references, but the standard ChatGPT is not doing this to my knowledge. So basically, how do you ensure that the answers you're getting, or how do you evaluate them to know if they're true or not? Hamda, are you are you able to yes. unmute your mic? Yep. Uh, as an AI model, ChatGPT uh, will not have control over the input. Uh, it receives the response via that uh, via just insert. However, it designed to uh, generate responses that are as accurate and helpful as possible based on the information available to us through ChatGPT. It is important to note that the information uh, it provides is not a, a substitute for professional advice or uh, guidance from a teacher or expert in the field. Um, but uh, but if, there were, if a student is experienced hallucinations or other concerning symptoms, uh, it is essential that they seek professional, uh, I mean, professional chat GPT uh, plus usage. Uh, I think that is the answer for it. Okay, thank you for that answer, Hamda, and thank you for the question. Um, I'd like to bring up another question that's addressed to Joshua Bailey. Uh, the question, how is the Lang chain developed? Is it trained or rule-based? And how would you add new functions to it? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I, would, I would say to just look up the Lang chain documentation. It's very flexible. It has high-level abstractions, but also gives you granular control where you want it. So in the demonstration that I showed, I created predefined type on functions, and I said, like, hey, if you want imagery, use this function. Um, and then it just uses the context to know when to use which functions. So you can write your own functions, or you can even have it write its functions. Um, it's a lot of control. Okay. Thank you, Joshua. <laughs> um, sorry, did you have something else? You were fading out there a little bit. No, I just, like I just said, I hope that's a sufficient answer. Kind of vague, um, but you do have as much control as you'd like, I should say. All right, thank you for that answer uh, and for that question. Let's see, we've got just uh, a little bit more time. So um, I'm not sure who this question was addressed to, but I'm hoping that someone uh, will jump in here. So can we use diffusion models to enhance raster resolution? Pat, you want to take yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can take this question. So basically, you, I think the answer, the answer is yes. But basically, we have seen lots of these conditional uh, data generation tasks, for instance, image super resolution or um, image colorization. So the idea here is that we would actually want to condition on uh, let's say a raster at the lower resolution, and then we train this uh, diffusion model to do conditional generation to generate better resolution rasters. Right, thank you, Chenlin. Um, I appreciate that, that answer. Let's take 
one more. I'm afraid we're not going to have time to answer to address all the questions in the chat, but I would invite the speakers to comment on the questions that are addressed to you and maybe answer them uh, if they haven't already. So let's do one final question for Anna and potentially others. Uh, I'm interested in, interested in governance in action and addressing the power imbalance between the, those creating and mobilizing these technologies and citizens. So Anna. Yeah, thanks, uh, Shiloh. This is a great question uh, and it's a big one, but I would start with uh, having a closer look at pri the private sector, specific specifically big tech and how it can be regulated and not just self-regulated. So government regulations is part of that governance in action. Um, but I read earlier this morning about communal standards of ethics and setting that scene for transparency, also to lead to accountability, knowing that transparency to accountability is not a direct line of action. And of course, better public consultation. So this provides an opportunity to just make government better um, and to uh, be honest and realize who uh, is excluded from the tables of governance and how we can engage with community-based grassroots expertise, uh, not just technical expertise, not just policy expertise, and um, yeah, organizing efforts uh, behind those movements. All right, thanks so much, Anna, for that answer. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. I'm afraid we can't get to more of them, but um, I hope that we can get them answered directly through the, the chat. Um, so this concludes our lightning talks session, and we're going to take another five minute break. And after that, we'll come back for our first panel. So thanks for joining and see you soon. <laughs>